probably a long week for you, and it's been a long week for me, too. Uh, hopefully this will be entertaining enough and in a good way um, to keep you here until the cocktail hour starts at 7 o'clock. Um, this is the first time I've done this. I'm going to be presenting a keynote from my iMac, uh, reading from my iPad. My eyes were getting a little bleary from uh, being up so long, so I was going to use my iPhone, which has a close-up uh, viewer on it, uh, so that I could put it in front of the iPad, read through the iPhone, <laughs> the iPad, and present off the iMac. But I don't have to do that. I only have to use two of them. Um, okay. Um, let me first thank John Tunnell for inviting me here, especially after our, after our uh, shenanigans on bowling night at last year's Computers and Writing Conference at the University of Michigan. Uh, we have both recovered admirably since then, I think. Thanks, John, and all of you at the University of Florida for inviting me. We have at least uh, two new Parlor Press authors here with us in the audience. So thanks to you, too, for trusting that Parlor Press will treat you and your books well. I should mention that uh, also uh, a few years ago, Parlor Press published an edited collection by Jeff Rice and Marcel O'Gorman uh, called New Media, New Methods. The original title uh, had been The Florida School, uh, or had that in the title a la the Frankfurt School, uh, but the series editor, uh, and certainly not me, however, uh, nipped that idea in the bud. Sorry about that. Uh, I'm proud to say that the book is doing quite well and representing the Uni University of Florida's fine students quite well. The uh, lingering hegemony of print and the emergence of new technologies for producing, distributing, and displaying books have book publishers in a quandary. The culture of production, from authorship through publication, still privileges print-based composition, even as print culture declines. Yet publishers also have better tools for creating new kinds of books and reaching readers across a wide range of media and interfaces. For most publishers, and hence authors, however, books still begin as printable documents. A huge post-production industry helps publishers and authors retrofit, uh, retrofit print as digital, converting it to formats for tablets, smartphones, the Kindle, or the web, for example. It's a losing battle if you're a publisher, a constant source of frustration if you're a reader, a mystery if you're an author. It will take years for the publishing industry to sort out all of this as factions battle over standards, platforms, rights, mechanisms of distribution and delivery, and more. book on the mount. Uh, when we talk about books these days, especially uh, um, when newspapers and websites and pundits talk about books, um, we don't talk much about what they are. Um, but instead we talk about how they're distributed, how to interact with them, uh, and through what kind of interfaces the advantages of printed books, you know, they smell nice, um, you can take them to the bathtub, things like that, read them on the beach, in any kind of lighting. Um, sometimes we talk about their convenience, of course, uh, and, and occasionally we talk about the interactivity of digital books. We talk about reading them, in other words. We talk about using them either as material artifacts 
or fodder for interpretation. There's nothing wrong with that, I guess, but book is more. In his book, Where Writing Begins, Michael Carter begins by quoting the illustrious and prescient Sid Dobrin, who posed one of the toughest questions of all time in his 2002 Four Seas presentation. <laughs> uh, from writing processes to cultural reproduction, composition's theoretical shift, Sid poses this critical question for the field of composition. What is writing? Uh, this question, uh, by the way, uh, is deceptively hard or deceptively simple. I'm not sure. Um, when I uh, interviewed for a position at Purdue University about 10 years ago, um, I was running the gauntlet of uh, meetings with deans and faculty members, search committees, Janice Lauer, that was uh, an experience in itself. Um, and then uh, at the end of uh, two days of interviews, I got to meet with the undergraduate professional writing majors. And all the faculty left the room, and there were five or six undergraduate students. And the first question they asked was, so what do you think writing is? And that just stumped me. It's not an easy question to answer, as, as Sid pointed out. Um, well, uh, in ignoring this question, uh, Sid says, uh, we have neglected the thingness of writing as an object of study in need of serious conception and reconception. Oh. Okay. That wasn't swiping right, was it? <laughs> so, uh, what is a book? Where do they begin? Uh, this is a flourish, uh, which is pun on flourish, uh, from Kenneth Burke. From the very start, our terms jump to conclusions. For Burke, there is a paradox in the ways that uh, logical and temporal priority blur in the act of creation, so that what comes first, the idea or the act, the will or agency, is not clear. Um, Michael Carter makes this the subject of his book, uh, Where Writing Begins, and, and he writes about this, uh, uh, citing Burke uh, in various spots. Uh, As both temporal and logical, beginnings represent for Burke the terminological power residing in symbolic acts. Key terms, he says, are beginnings, for implicit in all terminology is a conclusion that is present from the beginning. Uh, interestingly, this was from a speech Kenneth Burke gave to uh, Bennington College, uh, a commencement speech called De Beginnivus. And it was Burke's bright idea that the uh, audience was most attentive uh, at the beginning of a speech. Uh, and so he decided to make beginnings the subject of the speech and um, he kept promising to get to the beginning of the speech, and then it was over. <laughs> Presumably that kept the audience's attention the whole time, but I don't know if that actually worked. Um, so, uh, Carter continues, definitions are also beginnings, though Burke observes that, quote, it is a somewhat ironic fact of history that often a writer does not clearly work out such beginnings until quite late in his speculations or investigations. Definitions, then, are principles that exist in beginnings, but are not necessarily identified until much later by the author or a critic, further emphasizing the paradoxical relations of temporal and logical priority. So, again, what is a book? Where do they begin? Suppose the beginning of books was not print, but digital. What new kinds of writing, of textuality, of mediated spaces can authors create? Can or should book publishers help writers develop these new forms? Where will books begin in 10 years? Where and how will writing begin? How will the culture of production change? 
How will institutions and readers respond to the book's new beginnings? So, um, rather than be preoccupied with this, or this, this is a, uh, a CD-ROM. A CD-ROM uh, looking like a buzz uh, destroying literature. Uh, I was thinking about this image today on the plane, uh, and I looked across the aisle, and a gentleman had uh, the Wall Street Journal, um, which has the featured headline uh, on the front page, blowing up the book. I thought that was interesting. Uh, referring to Apple's big announcement yesterday. Um, I hope you're as excited as I am to hear what Bob Stein has to say tomorrow. Tonight, I want to say a few words about how Bob might respond to the question, what is a book? And where does it begin? I don't mean to preempt anything he might say tomorrow, and he will no doubt prove me wrong. But I do want to point out that he's one of the few who has seen in the book, and it's changing circumstances in our digital age, its potential to change how we view authorship, not to mention publishing. In, his, uh, in the interview in Triple Canopy, Mao, King Kong, and the Future of the Book, here's what Bob says in response to Dan Vissel's question about whether Bob's interest in books ever waned. The book was always fundamental to me. One of the things I really liked was that the original logo for Criterion, uh, which we designed in 1984, was a book turning into a disc. It was central. That's, the, that's it on the uh, left. Um, this is purely an accident. Uh, that's the center of the Parlor Press logo on the right. Um, and um, I didn't know that Bob had uh, created that logo uh, of the book changing into a CD, but the uh, part of press logo is, is like a scroll that becomes a book and it's uh, uh, hovered over by a CD. Um, I mentioned to you a few Actually, people. Ours is, ours is a video disc, they didn't have CDs then. Oh, that's right, okay. Um, originally, the uh, part of press uh, logo there um, didn't have the CD and it didn't have the little lines on it. And uh, we were uh, running the logo by a bunch of students. And uh, one of my friends at Grand Valley State showed it to his undergraduate students. And, and uh, everybody seemed to like this particular logo um, until one student pointed out that it looked like a roll of toilet paper. Um, and I said, oh my god, it does. And thank goodness that uh, we didn't go forward with the original conception on that. And, uh, we added the lines and did a little tweaking. and So it only vaguely looks like a roll of toilet paper now. Well, uh, Bob continues. Uh, when I was writing the paper uh, on digital media for Britannica, I felt like I had to relate the idea of interactive media to books. And I was really wrestling with the question, what is a book? What's essential about a book? What happens when you move that essence into some other medium? And I just woke up one day and realized that if I thought about a book not in terms of its physical properties, ink on paper, but in terms of the way it's used, that a book was the one medium where the user was in control of the sequence and the pace at which they access the material. I started calling books user-driven media. 
In the same interview, here's what Bob says in response to Dan's question about Bob's interest in tool making. That get, gets back to HyperCard. What was cool about it was that people who couldn't program could write HyperCard. Teachers, particularly high school teachers, glommed onto it big time. The first tool we made was the Voyager video stack, which let teachers make HyperCard stacks to control laser discs. Then, when we made the first CD-ROMs, teachers said the same thing. This is fantastic. I want to do that. So then we made the first electronic books. People said, wow, this is amazing. How do we do this? So we made the, the expanded books toolkit, which used HyperCard to allow people to create their own electronic books. Uh, even though he wasn't a programmer, Bob could use HyperCard to make this new kind of book, and from that, everything else became possible. If not with HyperCard, perhaps its future incarnations in other forms like TK3 Author and Sophie. Making the book, from a publisher's perspective at least, meant developing and applying new tools to realize the vision of a born digital book. And I think uh, um, what I'm very interested in is how teachers, uh, and I think, uh, I hope, ultimately writers will glom on to uh, these tools to start conceiving of their books as born digital from the beginning, rather than um, opening Microsoft Word and starting their book as a printed document and then retrofitting everything else later. So far I've been talking mostly about books as artifacts of the publishing cycle, but what happens if we jump closer to the beginning to consider what books mean for authors? They obviously mean many things. These days, unfortunately, they sometimes mean for people in academia the difference between a promotion and a job search. Setting aside for a while the whole issue of books as intellectual and symbolic capital in the academic system, uh, Lori's going to talk to us about that, right? Uh, an issue uh, that Kathleen Fitzpatrick and others have discussed eloquently and provocatively. What does it mean to author a book? What did it mean 20 years ago? And what does it mean now? I think we're seeing an interesting but very gradual shift of attention from the user-driven book to the author-created book toward production and composition evident in the wider cultural shift in our do-it-yourself world. It is a painfully slow process. It is emergent and in many ways consequential to the development of the publisher's tools and what people like Chris Anderson have called the democratization of production. This progress toward a new beginning for the book, one that might begin with the author, may require much more cultural re-engineering than we might have thought. Just think of what had to happen in this shift. The librarian in the 16th century, in the painting by Giuseppe Arsimbolido, this is my conception of the library in the 21st century. Um, and then these next two examples might help shed some light on what we can do as authors, as publishers, writers, teachers, and with people like Bob Stein leading the charge. Uh, Dean Kamen, the inventor of the Segway, knew that re-engineering the culture and the law so that the Segway could, would be accepted and used would prove to be much more of a challenge than the invention itself. Um, so they spent uh, quite a few years uh, trying to get laws changed in communities all over the country so, so that people could ride Segways on sidewalks and streets and so on. Um, the one thing that I think he missed or he underestimated uh, was the stigma of the glam factor. However, because the Segway still is way too cool to ride around the campus. Unfortunately, right? Um, a similar situation, uh, and Richard Lamb discusses this in his book, The Economics of Attention, 
uh, is uh, Christo's Running Fence. And uh, Christo has a, a variety of projects like this. Uh, the latest one, I think, is a, a giant uh, cloth screen over uh, a river in Arkansas. Um, the art for Christo is not so much the fence itself. Uh, this particular one ran for um, something like 30 or 40 miles uh, from Sonoma County all the way to uh, Bodega Bay in Northern California. Uh, through farmland and federal land and uh, communities and so on. Um, the art was not um, making the fence itself, but all of the activity and discussion that went into allowing it to happen. Changing zoning laws, getting approval from local governments and landowners, receiving the approval of the federal government to not only use its land, but also waive environmental regulations. In posing the question the beginning of books, I mean to focus on production. Uh, and to get there by extending what authors typically call process to a more situated, collaborative, and technological conception of production. And uh, this is the, the kind of cultural re-engineering, at least in the uh, realm of authorship, that I think is, is ongoing. Um, and it's still going to take some time. Um, for it to happen. And we have all heard about this democratization of production. Uh, it is reflected in our digital, uh, or excuse me, our do-it-yourself culture, DIY, from Wikipedia to HGTV's renovation nightmares. Here are some questions. Um, that come to my mind. What does it mean to publish for a publisher and for an author, and how are those different? How can we ensure that scholarly publishing by presses, by authors, is not compromised by the ease with which content can be disseminated? How can publishers take advantage of the new technologies of production, making the books themselves, and in turn, passing this knowledge to authors? How can we change the culture of printing and publishing enough to sustain these new printing and publishing technologies? Uh, interestingly, uh, 10 years ago when um, I started Parlor Press, the first question that I heard from a lot of people or critique was that it was not sustainable. Um, but we've been going 10 years now, and uh, I think we put out uh, 20 books since November. Um, and I'm still alive at the moment. <laughs> So it's sustainable for the time being, I guess. And 10 years is not bad for a publishing company. Um, especially, we, we have no budget and no staff. Uh, but a lot of uh, people working really hard uh, all across the country, and, and that includes authors. Um, these are not easy questions to answer. I'm tempted to say, just do it. Uh, but these, and the bigger question, uh, what is a book, are ones that I hope and I know will be discussed today, tomorrow. Well, as you heard yesterday, Apple launched its e-textbook projects at the Guggenheim to much fanfare. I didn't show you all those other bullets, but I read them to you. So. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, they unveiled uh, yesterday, if you haven't heard, uh, iBooks 2, uh, which is the uh, ebook reader app. Uh, the primary difference in iBooks 2 is that there are annotation tools uh, that are uh, pretty nice now. Um, but I think uh, even more interestingly um, is the iBooks author app. <laughs> A production tool that allows drag and drop creation of rich media ebooks, theoretically at least. Uh, and from an author's perspective, they may be on the right track. Uh, the same one, interestingly, in, interestingly, that Bob Stein has been on for more than 20 years. Uh, here's an ebook that I made last night using iBook Author. Uh, it's short, it's only a couple of pages. But it's not bad, I guess, as a proof of concept.
hours, don't put all these articles with hundreds of links in them. Oh, I know. It's got to be made by hand. I didn't realize that. You can add a video at the start of your book, and so I did that. That's actually Bob uh, eight years ago when we made a, uh, a book called Digital Publishing F5 Refreshed uh, at Computers and Writing 2003. Uh, um, we had a lot of the content already produced. Uh, we produced a lot more of it during the uh, workshop, uh, and we published the book in four hours and 12 minutes. Uh, and it still is on the web at the Parker Press. It has multiple authors, it has video in it, and that was one of the videos. Uh, thankfully, Bob was there to help us with the production uh, because we did it in TK3. Uh, that was uh, one of five books uh, ever. Uh, or the, the first, among the first five books ever cataloged in uh, MLA uh, that was a born digital ebook. Uh, so I think that was kind of interesting. But anyway, uh, here's the uh, here's the fantastic book I created last night in ten minutes. It's not really that fantastic. Uh, you can see the little navigation uh, down at the bottom that gets built automatically, uh, and then we. sample page you can dump text in and create uh, little, little content sidebars there. That's part of the template uh, and that's the end. You can add your copyright information and so on. Um, but what's interesting is that it's just really easy to do. It's going to be um, something that uh, we'll probably see a lot of people uh, trying out and making really bad books. Like this one, I guess. This one's never going to be published. Um, <laughs> but you might try it out, it's free. It's a small step, uh, and I seriously doubt that many textbook publishers of the New York and Boston sort uh, will be using iBooks Author to manufacture their books. Um, the uh, writing handbook um, that I did with the uh, Cengage, um, the full version of it is 1,300 pages long, uh, and that's in the designed version. Uh, if I printed it out uh, as a Microsoft Word document, uh, it was, I didn't measure it by pages, it was feet. Uh, I think it was about four feet tall, uh, 5,000 pages. Uh, and I just can't see that being put into one of these books at the moment, um, but we'll see. Um, but where do we go from here? Uh, some of these tools are being passed down to authors. Uh, where do we go from this, from this kind of book? Um, and I'll just take a few moments to tell you what Parler Press is up to. Um, my philosophy of production has been to try to create the conditions that foster emergent and new patterns of order. So in other words, we do it to see what will happen. We make it possible for authors to, to do the same, uh, or to see if it's even possible. We want to create new conversations about what books, authors, and even publishers can be. The Parler Press name, as some of you know, comes from this passage in Kenneth Burke's uh, The Philosophy of Literary Form, Studies in Symbolic Action. Um, and I, I'll read this to you because I know it's probably hard to see. Um, Burke is talking about uh, where authors um, get their materials for their work um, from the human drama, the ongoing drama of human relations. Where does the drama get its materials? From the unending conversation that is going on at a point in history when we are born. Imagine that you enter a parlor. Uh, so that's exactly where it comes from. Uh, the domain name was available, Parlor Press. Uh, that's critical. I own the trademark 
parlor. So if you want to uh, do something related to a book or an ebook and you want to use parlor, you're going to have to pay me. It'll be cheap, though, I promise. Uh, okay, imagine you enter a parlor, you come late. When you arrive, others have long preceded you and they are engaged in a heated discussion, a discussion too heated for them to pause and tell you exactly what it is about. In fact, the discussion had already begun long before any of them got here or there, so that no one present is qualified to retrace for you all the steps that had gone before. You listen for a while until you decide that you've caught the tenor of the argument. Then you put in your oar. Someone answers, you answer him. Another comes to your defense. Another aligns himself against you to either the embarrassment or gratification of your opponent, depending upon the quality of your ally's assistance. However, the discussion is interminable. The hour grows late, you must depart, and you do depart with the discussion still vigorously in progress. Here, the drama is the author's and the parlor is to speak, to wrangle. Uh, it's also a room, a room for speaking. Uh, to wrangle as in parliament, in the parliamentary. To gamble as in parlay. Uh, and yet it can't be adequately put into terms. It is interminable. To get things moving along, we're going to be spending quite a bit more effort knocking on the doors of authors who ought to be writing great books, print, digital, or otherwise. Um, one of the things that has happened as the, the company has grown is that we're uh, always responding to uh, what we receive because it's a huge flow of uh, manuscripts coming in. Um, probably, uh, you know, as many as 300 a year, uh, which is difficult to keep up with. Um, and so we're always reacting and never being too proactive, but uh, we're going to be changing that so that the flow in is going to be uh, slowing down uh, and the editors, uh, we have about 20 of them for uh, 16 book series, two new ones about ready to launch, uh, one on game studies um, by, uh, edited by Cynthia Haynes and Jan Olmovic, and another one on uh, violence and popular culture uh, to be edited by Phil Simpson. Um, but the editors are going to be going after great authors. And that's already happened. So for example, Byron Hawk spoke to Gregory Ulmer about any projects that he might have. Uh, so um, Avatar Emergency is due out in a few weeks. Uh, we're working on several more new series. Uh, there are actually some people here. I want to uh, twist their arms a little bit about uh, developing a series, but I'll not give any more away on that. Uh, we're going open source and open set access in a big way. One of these days, I'm tempted to just release all parlor press books as open access books. Just do it. See what happens. Uh, we do that with a, with a lot of books already. Uh, they tend to be our biggest print sellers, too, interestingly. The uh, reference guides to rhetoric and composition, which are published free at the WAC Clearinghouse, uh, have done really well in print. Uh, and partly, we're capitalizing on people's insecurity about the digital uh, book. Um, we know that they want the printed book because it will last, and they can read it in the bathtub. I don't know why anybody would want to read a reference guide to rhetoric and composition uh, and writing across the curriculum in the bathtub, but who knows? If you dropped it, it would probably electrocute you. I didn't know composition is bathed. Science stuff. Yeah. Uh, we're going all in for the digital. Uh, we're working on a book now that uh, uh, I have a student doing an MA uh, project on. Um, the uh, book is authored by Bob Paul Britter, who's uh, great with digital media, uh, and his book is called Lights, Mics, Symbolic Action, and Audiovisual Rhetoric for Writing Teachers. Uh, that will be the first iPad book in our field uh, and releases in May at Computers and Writing. Uh, we're running workshops at multiple conferences to teach authors how to write books for these new interfaces, mindful, 
that from the very start our interfaces jump to conclusions. Who knows what will become of the book or what it is. Maybe we will find out one of these days. After all, books are equipment for living. Uh, that's our slogan. Uh, that comes from Park, too. I just can't get out from under his umbrella, I guess. And that's the end. Thank you. Um, 
So one of the other challenges that's facing um, the future of the books, is all, uh, the future of the book in academia, is also dealing with things that can't be printed in books uh, in a traditional book form because of the changes in the market. Um, about a month ago, I was, uh, had a conversation with a brilliant scholar who's working on a digital archive and a digital scholarship project devoted to a particular author. And she's doing so because she's not going to be able to have the book, have it printed as a book. And that's because of market forces, not because it isn't needed for scholarly intervention in the field. So what she told me was that she would love to write her next book solely on one author. But she knew that it wouldn't get published because it was a, a because scholarly uh, books on single and currently unknown authors normally don't get published because of market for forces. So instead, she's writing a larger study of the area of the period with a chapter devoted to the author. And so for that scholar, the market forces have determined that she can't write her book. But in, for her field, the scholarly intervention in the field, a, a book-like form is what's needed, or so she thinks. But it may or may not be that a digital scholarship project that addresses the same concerns meets the needs better um, or not. But that's something that she's pushing for in order to make the intervention in the field. And in working with her on that, I want to make sure that she gets credit for the work that she's doing. So she's doing this in lieu of doing a book because she knows that it's needed for the intervention in the field. But how do we get it to count? And count as a book or count as something else? Do we deal in equivalencies or do we deal in new categories? And I'm in working on what counts. Um, I'm working a lot with uh, Sophia Aker from the Center for Humanities in the Public Sphere, who's very interested in how we make things count and how we make things measurable, um, and how we make things count, obviously, for all types of attribution, for the scholars, for the uh, departments, and in terms of public scholarship and impact. The challenges uh, and changes for the book are also informing the dissertation, um, which is often a sort of proto-book. I don't know if everyone already read about the MLA panel um, just recently at the, at the 2012 MLA in Seattle, um, where there was a one panel presentation on the future of the dissertation, and they were studying the dissertation as a proto-book, and the need to change that, because while some research is best served by having a proto-book form for the dissertation, and often dissertations do go on to become books, in many cases that's not the best way to serve the graduate students. It doesn't serve them for their professionalization, for orientation to the field, and for their entry into scholarly communication and into those networks. And so how do we change that? But how do we change that in a way that's supported? One of the sort of tellingly painful things about that presentation was that 46% of departments don't have guidelines or recommendations or best practices for what a dissertation should be like. That's pretty difficult for people to deal with. We're not telling people what it should be like, but we have a general assumption that it should be somewhere between 200 and 1,000 pages what the panel came out with. It's pretty broad, it should be like a book, but we're telling everyone that the book is changing, the, the nature of scholarly communications with the focus on the book is changing and that may not be sustainable, but we're not preparing people for what else could there be, you know, and how can they enter into the scholarly communication network in a meaningful and useful way. So, um, but changes are underway in that regard, and changes are also underway um, in how we do the differences with book, digital archive, digital scholarship projects, what we do and what we can do. Um, I, I briefly touched on my in my response on some of the problems um, and changes for the future of the book and scholarly communications. From the um, and I've also touched on the perspectives of some of the institutional supports in terms of credit, um, in terms of the Center for Humanities and the Public Sphere, um, people like me in the libraries, and other people that are talking about these issues at MLA that are developing new supports. Obviously, Parlor Press is an entry, entry into this, and a new way to do, I'd love to see and know more about your business model, um, and how that works, and how, you know, how institutional credit counts for service, um, or if some of that counts for research, and how that can inform the rest of the field. So, while there are a number of problems that are going on, and a number of changes um, and impacts, a lot of these, I'd like to conclude by emphasizing that many of these can be very productive. Obviously, Parlor Press is doing very productive things. 20 books out since November, with real entry into the field, publishing on extremely well known by extremely well known authors. You have a really elaborate network, and you have 20 different editors and two different series that are coming out. And so, while we're in a time of declining library, university press, and university budgets, and a time when scholarly publishing is being forced to change, we're also in a time when we can take advantage of those changes. And so, we can 
and to have real impact on the humanities and academia and society. Because the humanities have the opportunity to more thoroughly communicate with the public, to engage in the public and scholarly concerns, and to conduct scholarship in the public. So the changes in scholarly publishing are offering us many, many opportunities. And so I think it's an extremely exciting time for academia and an exciting time for the future of the book. Thank you. <laughs> uh, just one, one quick little point of clarification. As of last night and this morning, CNN and New York Times were reporting that Apple has partnered with Pearson, McGraw, and two other textbook companies already. So that that is already going to happen. So. Yeah, yeah, I read that. Uh, they, uh, one of the other companies is a division of Cengage. Right, uh, right. Houghton Mifflin, Harcourt, I guess. Okay. Um, I read the uh, biology book. Um, it was pretty interesting, but uh, not very dramatic. There, there was one page that had a bunch of flamingos on it. Did, did you happen to see that one? Uh, it was a great example of using illustration that, that has nothing to do with the text that I could discern. It just looked pretty. Um, and that happens when you have authors writing some of the content, uh, and then designers or uh, other people um, you know, dressing up the book, doing the layout, and there's not much communication between them. That's why I think it's important for authors to be in on uh, some of these, uh, uh, some of this production. Uh, when I did this uh, writing handbook, it was so complicated uh, in terms of its layout and design. It had the main text is in the margins as marginalia, and these inner columns uh, are images and project checklists and that sort of thing. And there was this one uh, two-page spread where it had to explain the research process in a field such as biology uh, and. How, how does this occur? How do biologists approach questions and give examples of this? And it had to do that in two pages and be very thorough. Um, and the only way I could think of doing it was to compose it in Adobe InDesign, because I tried to do it in Microsoft Word. And you know I would put an image after some text, and then the image would go halfway down in between pages. And, and I, I was spending hours trying to move these things around so that I could compose in a kind of organic way. And I said, well, that's not working. So I, I did it in Adobe InDesign, what it should look like, sort of, kind of amateurish. But uh, the designers got the idea. And then they put their uh, 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 creativity on it and their, and their professional skill. And it came out looking really good. Um, uh, oddly enough, though, I had to take it out of InDesign uh, I had to make a PDF of it so they could see what it looked like laid out, and then I had to take it out of InDesign and put it back into the form of a Word document and send them the Word document uh, so that they could deal with that. So that on the publisher end, they couldn't deal with any other kind of production from the author either. In your talk, and you've got this movement from print to, to digital, and you talk about born digital books, but I'm wondering if that linearity doesn't break down in some ways, particularly I'm thinking, and I just mentioned to you, uh, there, there was an essay that ran in New Yorker a couple of years ago called I Heart Novels, and it's about the cell phone novel industry, uh, particularly in Asia, where novels are being scripted in text on cell phones, and they pick up these large followings of readership, and once they hit a million readers, then the publishers come after the authors and publish print versions, which are, which are selling millions of copies, it's a huge industry, to publish print versions of cell phone novels. And so I'm wondering about how we're casting this as a linear move from print to digital, rather than really rethinking this as almost cyclical, that it, it's going both ways at the same time, just depending on the context. Mm -hmm. um, we have a book series that has tried to do something like that. It's not, not as interesting, but uh, you've probably seen uh, The Valve, uh, the blog, uh, and then Crooked Timber. Uh, we've done a couple of books that were uh, collections of uh, a give and take with a, an author. One of them was uh, Franco Moretti. Um, um, 
all the uh, responses by the critics and put uh, the editors put these together and um, and they've re-edited them and then we published the book and made it open source. Um, that's been a lot of work to do that and they nobody buys it at all. I mean, they download it and read it, but it's a lot of work for making a printed version. Uh, um, and and I worry that it, it's a kind of a feeble attempt to give it legitimacy or more legitimacy by making it into print. That doesn't have anything to do with the cell phone novels, but um, I, I want to see an author uh, from the very beginning, wherever the beginning might be, uh, think about uh, what a book is and then begin to compose it and research it and, and develop it and collaborate with others on it uh, as a, a, a work that will be digital uh, and that takes advantage of all the possibilities there. That would be really interesting to try to do that. Um, we've had a couple of people uh, actually who are under contract with Parlor Press uh, to do that sort of thing. Uh, one was on visual rhetoric and rep uh, uh, photographic representations of 9-11. Um, that uh, got under contract in 2004 and it hasn't appeared yet. Uh, and then there's another one on designing multimedia that uh, they finished the first chapter and that was it. Um, it it's a lot harder than writing a regular book, unfortunately. Yeah. Follow up to that. Could you talk a little bit about the changing relations between the editor and the author with an ebook? I mean, I'm curious about what, how the editor's role changes and, the, and, like, and what that collaboration looks yeah, like. Yeah, what's, what's the changing relationship between author and editor yeah. uh, as you go more toward the digital? Uh, it becomes much more collaborative, uh, definitely. Um, um, you know, kind of in a, in a way, we don't have these kinds of relationships too much in academia, but um, you've probably read stories about, um, you know, uh, great novelists and their great editors behind the scenes and how they've gone back and forth over years refining and developing a book so that the, the editor is almost like a co-author. Um, but they don't get any credit for it. They get a salary. Um, with, with digital productions, the collaboration has to be very close. Um, I remember in 2003 when Bob uh, presented the Computers and Writing, he told us a story about uh, Stephen Jay Gould and the uh, book that you guys were uh, producing and um, how difficult it was, how, how important that collaboration was. Um, And that's where the real time commitment comes in because the editors are busy. Um, they have all these other projects going on and, and the, the authors are busy and it can be consuming. Is the, is the sole responsibility for all the doc design issues, all of that, you know, all the coding, all of that's placed on the author? Or is the editor collaborating on that level too? Uh, there's collaboration on that level. Design, layout, all of that. Um, um, I spend quite a bit of time, even with printed books, um, I hope this pays off down the road some days. Uh, uh, I do a lot of training of authors in um, book production, um, partly because they have to take on more responsibility, you know, um, um, because I don't have enough time. Uh, uh, we don't have a team of editors who can do things for them, you know, like do their index and all of that. I teach them how to do the index um, using uh, concordance tables and things like that. Um, um, even mundane things like how to use track changes effectively. And, uh, but that's kind of at the level we're, we're at in a lot of cases now. We have to get way past that. John. Yeah. yeah. Microphone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Larry Taylor's point about the connection between thinking about the book and thinking about the dissertation. Um, what advice as a professor and as a publisher do you give to graduate students who are working on their dissertation in what seems like a transitional moment for books and for scholarship? Uh, <laughs> that's <laughs> a shit. <laughs> <laughs> what 
When we're at the beginning of it. Yeah. Uh, that, that's a really tough one. Uh, I, uh, I directed an MFA thesis that was pure hypertext and music in 1999. Uh, it was an amazing piece of work. Uh, I wasn't in the creative writing program, but I knew, you know, hypertext and web design a little bit, and so they let me direct it, which was pretty unusual. Um, the poets were there just to read the poetry. Um, um, uh, Justin Hodgson uh, at Clemson, uh, he, he's at University of Texas now, uh, he did his uh, dissertation in SOFI, uh, which is one of the uh, authoring tools that Bob developed. Um, and there's a print component to it also, uh, but it's a substantial piece of work. I mean, uh, and Justin is, is brilliant. Um, and he got a job from it, but now uh, he's got the dilemma of what to do with that. Um, all that work that he put into developing the, the digital book. Uh, he's being told that he needs to do a print book. Um, and he asked me at Parlor Press if we would do the digital book and if uh, he would mind if um, he took uh, the, the printed book to, you know, like Chicago or Oxford or something like that. Something legitimate. <laughs> I said, no, <laughs> we're not going to do your digital book. We'll do both or nothing. Well, and he understood that. Um, but the problem was is that the uh, University of Texas uh, uh, doesn't know what to make of the part of press, apparently. Uh, so that's when I write them a letter and I make sure I put all my credentials at the bottom of the letter. And then I also say editor and part of press. Or uh, ironically, they asked me to do a tenure review for the very people who they told not to publish at part of press. <laughs> Which is interesting. Um, 